Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, uh, hello to everyone who's joining us from across the globe. A warm welcome to all our viewers on YouTube. Uh, my name is Arkuja Chakravarti, and I'm an associate professor at Jindal School of Banking and Finance. I would like to thank all four presenters of 13th session of the third year, uh, of the third global finance conclave for presenting their ideas and knowledge with us and sharing their knowledge with us. At this point, uh, I would like to mention that Professor Prasanna Tantri, who is one of the presenters, uh, will not be able to join us for today's session owing to some personal reasons. Uh, and one of his co-authors, Mr. Srinivas Mahapatro, uh, has kindly agreed to present his paper today. So without much ado, I would like to invite Dr. Nidhi Agrawal, who is an assistant professor at IIM Udaipur, to start the session. She's going to present her paper uh, titled Surveillance of Overvalued Stocks, Implementation and Impact. Dr. Agrawal, the floor is yours. Hi, thanks, Arkara. Thanks, everyone. And uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I would first like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. It's, uh, it seems to be a great uh, event, and I really look forward to all the comments and suggestions on the work that I am doing. So uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Okay, is that visible? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. So the paper that I'm presenting is titled Surveillance of Overvalued Stock, uh, Stocks, Its Implementation and Impact. This is joint work with Surabhi Bhatia, who is working independently currently, and Bhargavi Zaveri Shah, who is a doctorate student at, who is pursuing her PhD at NUS. So what is this paper about? This is a paper which talk, which examines a unique surveillance measure that was implemented on the Indian equity markets. And the measure is called the graded surveillance measure. So what is the objective of this measure? The objective was basically to alert and advise investors to be extra cautious in dealing with certain set of scripts, which, uh, which, uh, which the exchanges and the regulators find uh, could, be, could have some sort of manipulation going on. So the uh, GSM framework primarily uh, aims to advise market participants to carry out necessary due diligence before uh, trading on such scripts. Now, what makes the GSM, uh, the graded surveillance measure, a, un a unique surveillance measure is that typically if you look at, uh, look at the measures worldwide, uh, the surveillance measures worldwide, you will see that um, most of the measures are uh, automated by the exchanges to detect market manipulation instances. So therein the exchanges uh, look at the uh, abnormal trading patterns. They look at uh, if there is unusual activity on some stocks uh, in order to find out that uh, there may be some manipulation going on. In comparison, the GSM uh, framework primarily, uh, primarily looks at firm fundamentals. It says that there are firms, the circular that, uh, that introduced the GSM framework uh, said that uh, there are certain firms which uh, which uh, see an abnormal price rise that is not in line with the financial health and fundamentals of the firm. So that so this makes it a very unique and different uh, surveillance mechanism, uh, which is uh, much different from what we have seen worldwide. Nowhere in the world have we seen any exchange implementing a measure which deals with firm fundamentals because primarily it's not the business of an exchange to be uh, to be uh, uh, engaging in the uh, in the in the in determining the true price of a firm so that's made the gsm framework quite unique and we aim to study as to what its impact is the second uh, second major difference between this gsm measure and other measures that we see worldwide is that most of the measures worldwide uh, uh, are exposed that means that once an order has been placed and the trade on the on that on a stock has been executed then uh, if the exchange finds uh, that there is some abnormal uh, activity going on they would uh, they would imp they would be uh, implementing those measures uh, the surveillance measures on those stocks however gsm is an ex ante measure wherein even before market manipulation may have happened on that stock the exchange is uh, uh, flagging that stock, saying that 
look, you need to be careful about this uh, stock before trading on it. So that's another uh, uh, key difference between this measure and the other measures that we see. And lastly, in most of the surveillance measure, typically any penalty or any action is taken up, uh, against um, the manipulator, the trader who has manipulated the stock um, uh, by way of his trading activity. But in the GSM framework, the way it has designed, the sanction or the penalty is uh, levied across all investors. It affects everybody who is trading on this uh, on the uh, on these set of stocks so that's uh, the given its unique uh, uh, unique features we thought that it would be interesting to see how this measure actually implements uh, impacts a firm uh, in terms of its cost of capital and in terms of its uh, fundamentals if at all and how it impacts investor participation so uh, over the next two, three minutes, I would talk more, uh, 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 I would provide more details about the criteria that is used to identify firms that are brought into the surveillance criteria, uh, surveillance measure. So uh, there are multiple stages of the GSM framework. Let me first show you the uh, stages in uh, that are uh, in this framework. Any firm uh, which is identified uh, to be placed into the GSM uh, framework could be placed in either of these uh, seven stages from zero to six. Uh, and uh, the first, uh, the basic uh, the, uh, stage is stage zero, where a warning is flashed on the, on, the, uh, on the screen of a trader who is placing an order on a stock which is under GSM. So the warning basically says that this stock is under surveillance. Do you want to uh, trade? Uh, do you want to go ahead? So basically, it is alerting to the investor that uh, uh, you may need to be careful, and uh, uh, it's kind of a small, uh, it's kind of a nudge that is being tried out on investor. So that is the stage zero. Uh, if a state, if a firm enters stage one. Then uh, the consequence of that stage is that um, the stock will be only traded uh, on a trade for trade basis, which means that there it will be there will only be physical settlement on that stock, and uh, there won't be any intraday trading. Plus, there would be a price band of less than five percent that would be implemented on that stock. Uh, in uh, from second stage onwards, we see that the measure gets more stringent. There are more uh, the costs of trading increases substantially from stage two onwards, wherein this additional surveillance deposit of hundred percent of trade value is required from the trader to be deposited on that uh, for trading in that stock. And uh, as we go further, stage three basically then restricts trading on that particular stock on a weekly basis. Once in a week uh, would that uh, stock trade. In stage four, uh, this uh, mechanism uh, only allows that, uh, uh, again, uh, the trading would be on a weekly basis, plus the deposit that has to be provided is 200% of trade, traded value. Note that this is over and above the margin that is required uh, before placing your trade. So basically all these stages, and as you come to the sixth stage, uh, trading is permitted only once a month with no upward movement in price. So as we go down these stages, we see that this, uh, the consequences uh, on the trading of, of the uh, tradability of a stock in the GSM framework becomes more stringent and even more difficult for any trader. Now, what is the criteria? The, uh, the, there is a predefined criteria based on which firms uh, would, uh, uh, would be placed into the framework. The criteria is specified um, by the exchange uh, in a circular that was dated in 20, uh, that was uh, released in 2018. Uh, so, if a firm enters, uh, if a firm uh, enters stage zero, it should meet the following criteria. First, uh, the net worth should be less than 10 crore and the net fixed assets should be less than 25 crores. In addition, it also says that the PE uh, ratio of the firm uh, would be uh, great, should be greater than twice the PE ratio of a benchmark index, which could be either Nifty 500 index or the S&P BSE 500 index or even firms with negative PE ratio would uh, uh, enter this, uh, this mechanism. So any firm that satisfy all these, uh, satisfies all these three criteria would uh, in principle be uh, 
be subjected to this uh, mechanism. If a firm is, uh, and remember that state zero is basically the flashing of a warning saying that uh, please, uh, this is under surveillance and uh, ensure that you uh, want to uh, trade in the script. Stage one criteria is slightly different from stage zero, where there is, there is this additional market cap criteria of less than 25 crore uh, and a PE ratio of greater than or equal to twice the 5500 uh, PE. So uh, that's the uh, that's these are the two major criteria that have been pro, uh, that have been disclosed by the exchanges in order to identify uh, uh, stocks that would be placed in this framework. So uh, what are what are we trying to understand here? We are just uh, we are trying to understand whether this mechanism of any advantage over the surveillance measures that are used worldwide. What is it that the GSM changes about investor participation and about firm fundamentals uh, that, uh, that perhaps has some benefits on the equity markets? So in order to do that, we have two sub-questions that we are primarily investigating. One is, is the criteria that has been uh, levied, uh, has been uh, uh, has been disclosed, is that being consistently applied across firms that meet the stated condition? So in that, we try to study the characteristics of firm that enter and exit GSM. And the secondly, uh, we also study the impact of firms uh, in terms of their stock returns as well as liquidity. What happens to uh, uh, the liquidity of such stocks? In order to do that, we use a DID and an event study framework where we identify a treated and controlled uh, set of firms using propensity score matching. And we also do this by using the Mahalnubis distance metric. So I will quickly show you the um, data that we, uh, we have uh, for this paper. Uh, we hand collect data on securities that were placed under GSM during March 2017 to 2019. The circular came in March 2017 and uh, it is still in place as of today. There are about 84 firms that are placed in the GSM mechanism. And uh, for our sample, we saw that about uh, for a two year sample, we saw that in total 121 securities were placed in this mechanism of which there were 111 unique firms. So there were 10 firms which uh, exited the GSM framework and then re-entered this framework later. So, um, how this uh, how this entry and exit happens is that the exchange on a quarterly basis reviews uh, the uh, firms that are in this mechanism and also reviews whether new firms need to be placed into this framework. If uh, the circular from the exchange specifies, and the exchange that I'm talking about here is the NSE, uh, uh, the circular specifies that if the if any particular firm does not meet the criteria that I described in this slide then it could be excluded from the GSM uh, framework. So uh, in our analysis, we, find, we see, we find that most of the firms uh, in our sample were placed in stage one, which means that they were subjected to trade to trade. That means there was no intraday trading on these stocks and only on a T plus two basis could you uh, sell, the, uh, sell, the, uh, sell a particular stock. The next uh, most uh, most uh, frequently observed stage was stage zero, where a warning message was flashed. In terms of the number of average days that a firm spends in this criteria, we see that firms that enter stage one uh, uh, have, uh, on an average, spent 97 days in this criteria, which means basically close to about uh, three and a half months. And the next most uh, frequently observed uh, uh, a stage in which a firm uh, uh, spent a large number of days is stage three, wherein you uh, wherein we see that trading is permitted only once a week and the additional surveillance deposit of 100% is required. So um, let me just give you some some of the stats about who these firms are, who these 110 firms are, 111 firms are, uh, which are were placed uh, into this criteria. So. Uh, just uh, the closing price of this uh, these stocks uh, on a median basis was rupees 5.8 and approximately 20,132 uh, 20, shares on a daily basis get traded on these stocks. A uh, number of trades on these stocks uh, is uh, relatively low, which is about 50. 
and the market cap is also about 209 million now if the interesting part here is that these are not some new firms that have been play, uh, that are being placed into this mechanism but they are they, these are firms that were listed on an average uh, at least 12 years back uh, so um, so these are relatively old firms uh, which have now which are now getting placed into this mechanism in terms of their industrial activity we saw the in terms of their industry we see that most of these firms are into wholesale trading business or some are into financial businesses as well uh, uh most of the firms about one fourth of the sample is um, uh, or comprised of the firms that are located in maharashtra followed by uh, telangana and uh, uh, hyderabad uh, and tamil nadu so uh, we were curious about understanding what was the shareholding pattern of firms that are placed in the gsm is it that there is a, uh, there is a very uh, small market float of these uh, uh, these firms but it does not look like uh, this this uh, column which is for non promoter holding it shows that uh, during the our sample period about 58% of the holding was by non promoters and of which a large percentage was by non promoter non institution meaning a lot of individual investors are holding these shares and we also observed that uh, there isn't there isn't any substantial change in the non promoter non institutional holding of these stocks during our sample period so in terms of uh, maybe we... sorry to interrupt you have got 5 more minutes to go yeah. uh so in terms of finding we find that um the criteria that was provided by the exchange uh, is not satisfied by all the firms that enter this mechanism only 34% of the total sample uh, sorry 34% of the total sample did not meet the pre specified criteria so we find some uh, instance of discretion that is being uh, rec- uh, that is being uh, used by the exchange in placing the firms under this mechanism uh we also uh, analyze whether firms that exit the criteria uh, stop exhibiting those uh, uh those uh, firm fundamentals uh, measures that the exchange is using in order to identify these stocks with uh, whether that criteria is still uh, uh, applicable for firms that exit and we see that out of the 47 firms that exited the gsm about uh, mo- uh, more than half of the firms actually continue to exhibit the pattern in terms of their financial health uh, that they had even uh, at the time of entering into the gsm mechanism so we did not really understand as to what actually changed about these uh, firms uh, which made them exit the uh, gsm framework in terms of the impact on stock returns on entry we see that when a firm enters the stage 0 uh, the treated firms which is shown by the black gold line we do not see much difference between the cars of cumulative abnormal returns of treated stock versus control stocks but we do see a large difference uh, for uh, stocks that uh, are placed in stage 1 so the returns of uh, stocks that are placed in stage 1 drop significantly relative to the control stocks for our analysis even in terms of liquidity we see that the amihud uh, we use the amihud liquidity ratio and firms that are placed in the gsm uh, framework exhibit higher uh, liquidity relative to the control firms this also is true for traded volumes and for number of trades uh, finally we also analyze the cumulative abnormal returns for firms that exit and we see that immediately after the firm exits the a uh, framework the firm experiences positive abnormal returns and also an improvement in the liquidity so all in all uh, the the our finding so far is that there is considerable ambiguity on the implementation of the surveillance measure even though the exchange circular says that only uh, firms that are identified in a particular uh, you know, set of measure uh, criteria would be placed into this mechanism it does not look like that this criteria is being fulfilled by all the firms then uh, we also uh, uh, our findings also imply that surveillance have uh, obviously cost in terms of exchanges uh, needing to put more resources to first determine the stocks uh, firms which are exhibiting such patterns and then placing them into gsm it is not clear what exactly their benefits are and if this uh, mechanism is helping uh, 
providing any uh, any benefit to the investors per se or for firms or as well in for that matter we only see that uh, in the investors impact is felt in terms of uh, stocks that are placed in stage 1 primarily because there is higher cost of trading you have to hold the stock for at least 2 days before exiting so it seems that that is what the channel which is impacting the cars of uh, stage 1 firms and it or uh, the findings also imply that the the uh, the, the mechanism Have, would have implication for the cost of capital for the firms we have not investigated this in detail so far but as we go uh, further we plan to uh, investigate that in more detail so that's all from my side i look forward to uh, hearing more comments and suggestions on this paper thank you thank you nidhi thank you so much for the wonderful presentation and i was not aware of this it's very relevant seems very contemporary but i think there are a couple of question i would like to ask you on behalf of the audience so first question so when let uh, i mean whenever there is a trigger if i if uh, whenever there is a trigger warning sign so would it not suggest that you should rather short the stock so it's like a signaling mechanism so the surveillance is kind of turning into a signaling for investors so would you not expect it make, or even if the investor was probably not planning to short the stock but once they will see the warning sign people would they there would be penalty to trade into that counter so there would be more like a shorting signal and second question i think kind of building on to the more like about the event that you have used so as the understanding goes the objective is to uh, have to achieve surveillance for the stock but how does penalizing every investor for something that a bunch of people have done Uh, kind of achieves that target so before i go on to the next yeah so uh, these are so the second question that you raise is exactly the question we are also asking like why why would you penalize everybody and this is this that's the reason we are uh, looking at uh, this measure simply because it it penalizes everybody uh, without Uh, any particular reason, right? And yeah, this is yeah. not the practice that is followed across the world. So I agree with you. Like, why should it be do, uh, done? And I we do not have the answer to that. Okay. With uh, respect to the first part, actually, uh, the signaling. Uh, see, uh, whether you short the stock first of all, I um, mean, obviously, you will have to borrow the stock from the FLBM market. You cannot simply short the stock without holding it. But uh, even if you were doing that, still the cost of trading would be there, right? You still have to imp. Uh, you still have to um, uh, deposit that two hundred percent of your uh, traded value. Your- Thing it has implications for shorting per se, but yeah, you're right that it is a way of signaling the investor that you look. I want you to be cautious about it. You should not be trading in this stock. So uh, to that extent, if that fulfills the purpose, then we should see that investors then selling of the stock because the moment the announcement comes in that these stocks will be uh, uh, will be uh, placed into GSM, then the investors should have sold the stock because otherwise the cost of trading would increase over the next six months, which is the typical time period uh, for which the stock is placed into this mechanism. But it does not seem like that is working. Only when the investor feels the cost of trading uh, uh, being impacted because of this mechanism, we see that investors uh, then uh, uh, reduce their trading activity. Otherwise, at least in terms of that flash message. it comes i it does not look like that is impacting the investors trading on these stocks uh, if that uh, answers the question yeah it it, it totally thank you uh, so one question is about kind of methodology so not that uh, i'm questioning the methodology it's just that a, th- a thought so you're using difference and difference but you have a very nice setting i believe for regression discontinuity discontinuity design because you have a cut off threshold of Absolutely. 10 crores and 25 crores and as my understanding goes the acceptance for or the interpretation of causal coefficients is much better in case of rdd in comparison to difference and difference so uh, why yeah. is it that you guys have done difference and difference and not rdd yeah actually the uh, so we also initially thought that we will implement an rdd but when we were uh, doing this then uh, it's uh, so we, we we were trying to understand uh, if you will find this um, so as i said first of all this threshold this 
uh, this continuity that we are seeing is not applicable right in the first place so there are some stocks which are not meeting this criteria but are still being placed and that's the reason this rdd framework is not working for us so initially when we thought about exercise we thought we will do an rdd but that simply becomes uh, uh, difficult in this setup only because not all stocks are meeting that uh, threshold criteria plus uh, there are multiple uh, uh, criteria for which we need to see how rdd would be implemented so uh, that was the reason we did not we have went ahead with the id rather than the rdd so one suggestion that has come from the audience is that you may try with fuzzy rdd that that something probably you may consider yes yeah. yes yes so we also uh, we also plan to do that going forward thank you yeah one last question if if you don't mind so yes. wondering whether you guys have uh, exploited some cross sectional heterogeneity across industry variants because of, it's a possibility that even if of course there is a size threshold but it's the all the industries will not behave different in the same way so yeah. are you anticipating uh yeah so uh, primarily uh, the problem is that when uh, we when we did matching right the sample size reduces to to 30 forms in the treated and the control sample which basically then uh, reduces your ability to do cross sectional uh, analysis so one uh, one one way of doing this is to uh, do kind of form fixed effects and then just not do did kind of thing but Uh, do a simple panel and control for everything else, and also then analyze uh, if we are getting similar results. So that is uh, something that we will we could we will try. We can try for sure. Yes, that that's that's great. Thank you, thank you so much, Mary. It was a wonderful presentation. So Thanks. just a, a little bit off off the topic. Do you really think that this achieves anything? This it looks like from the face of it, it looks like more like a whimsical decision than based in economics. it it does it actually raises a broader question about how much uh, uh, what are these surveillance measures doing really and uh, whether they should be there in the first place or not there is a lot of literature uh, primarily on delisting which also says that there uh, this was there was this 2008 paper by ms yohara which is published in the journal of law and economics where they uh, primarily lay out this only that there are uh, there are exchanges which exercise significant discretion in uh, identifying firms which should be delisted versus not there are firms that actually continue to uh, violate the norms exchange listing norms but still continue to trade and some other firms which are subjected to listing and the moment there are this this level of discretion that is coming into the enactment of any surveillance measure then uh, probably it is doing more harm than good so right now what i have presented is a very narrow way of uh, looking at this measure but it raises more broader questions about what are these surveillance measures really achieving and as investors and as firms all of us must be thinking about that so uh, yeah that's that's my take too on that one thank you thank you so much nidhi uh, it was a wonderful discussion and i learned quite a lot from your paper i certainly wasn't aware of this regular i'm sure our audience has benefited immensely from from the discussion So thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Nidhi. Thanks. So on this note, I would uh, uh, like to invite our next uh, speaker. It is my pleasure to invite Dr. Susan Thomas to present her idea uh, on on the topic of uh, information efficiency on firm credit measure. So Dr. Thomas Thomas is a research uh, research professor of business at Jindal Global Business School. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Susan. Thank you so Thomas much. Yours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, uh, it's a it's a new year for me at Jindal Global Business School, and it's fun interacting with all of you. Um, <clears throat> the nice thing about this paper that I am going to present is that uh, it has one of the co-authors as a backup uh, in case my internet dies because I am outside of Bombay. or my throat dies which happens quite frequently so let me start sharing my screen um <clears throat> are you able to see this yes it's visible so perfect 
So today the paper that I'm going to be discussing is going to discuss information efficiency of credit risk measures across firms. This is joint work with Nidhi, who you just heard speaking. She's at IIM Udaipur, of course, and a colleague of ours, Manish Singh, who's at IIT Roorkee. This is actually a revised version and an updated version of an older paper, which looked at a slightly different question, but I think that there has been a nice change uh, about this question, which remains relevant because we are sitting in a time when uh, there are two years of a pandemic and a shutdown that has happened. <clears throat> that shutdown has caused a lot of stress to the firms. And over the last uh, couple of years, the entire world, not just India, has been asking about how to assess and take into account uh, the kind, the level of risk uh, or the financial health of uh, all of the firms across economies. So to be able to come up with an accurate and timely assessment of the financial health of a firm has always been important, uh, not just at the time of giving the loan, but also when you want to evaluate whether you need to hold the loan. And it has always had implications for financial investors like banks and other creditors. And of course, people like you and me who may have bought these bonds from firms and finally, of course, regulators who care about systemic risk of what happens not just to these firms, but to the financial uh, institutions that hold the loans and the bonds of these firms. <clears throat> now, very often, when we look at how we can see or understand the financial health of a firm, the information that's most often cited uh, and we believe that it's publicly accessible is the credit rating of the firm. Right? And it's a bit of a challenge a firm has multiple instruments, they could have different credit ratings. And that has been one of the challenges in understanding how do you map from the credit rating of an instrument to the financial health of the firm. Now, more recently, the space has uh, been taken, particularly for listed firms. These are firms whose stock market prices and bond prices you can observe on stock exchanges. Therefore, they are a lot more publicly accessible. Is something called the distance to default. And uh, what has emerged is that because these are coming from market prices, if the market prices are updated, we can actually get a measure of the financial health of the firm, which is updated at a more regular frequency as compared to the credit ratings. Credit ratings have got a much less regular and a much less frequent updating of their rating. And therefore, we don't see a more timely measure of the financial health. This came up uh, all across the world in episodes. Uh, the, the famous ones or the infamous ones are Enron and WorldCom. And of course, uh, the Lehman Brothers ratings didn't tell us anything about how badly their financial health was crashing. And yet, even when we look at the regulatory norms, on how a bank should be assessing the credit risk of a firm before making a loan to it, the reliance still remains on credit ratings. Okay, so it's a puzzle. And in this paper, what we are going to ask is, when we have these alternative measures for coming up with an assessment of the credit risk of the firm, uh, what is the information efficiency of these different measures? Okay, so if we have, I have two measures, where does the information about how the financial health of the firm may be improving or deteriorating, which measure captures this first? And that's what we call information efficiency. And once we are able to make a statement about uh, multiple measures and where the information is, perhaps, and this is not something that we can take for granted, if there is an information efficiency that is different across different measures, then can we make predictions about the changes in the credit rating of the firm? So what we're going to do in this paper is we're going to compare changes in the more timely, the more updated measure, which is the market price based distance to default measure and compare it to uh, the changes in credit ratings. Just to set a context, let me lay out what the literature knows about this field, right? So there are typically two measures, as I mentioned at the start of this talk. Uh, the, most, the more familiar one is the accounting-based credit scoring models. And why is this something that remains relevant today? Because all firms publish accounting data. And once you have a method to look at accounting data and get an assessment of financial health, then you can do this for all firms. The problem is that <clears throat> accounting information is 
frequently, right? It's not like you can get it uh, for some firms, you only get it once a year. For some firms, you can get it maybe four times a year or six times a year. But at the end of the day, at every point in time, you're basing your assessment of financial health on outdated information. And of course, we know that accounting information is subject to manipulation. How we interpret the same variable across different firms is can be different. And it is, at the end of the day, empirical. The model does not have a theoretical underpinning. The second measure uh, that we talked about is distance to default. And this comes out of uh, the Black and Scholes or the Merton which makes a model about how financial health can be tagged to the price, either the price of the bond or the price of the stock of the firm. And there was a firm called KMV that operationalized this theory, this model, called distance to default. Now, the pros is that because it's information, every time you get a change in the information, you can recalculate and recalibrate the, <clears throat> the uh, financial health of the firm. And it means that it's it is not likely to change when you look at a different sample. So across different samples, you should see similar dependence. Now, the con, of course, is that, as I said, it can be updated when the market price updates. If it is an illiquid stock, it does not update, update that frequently. And of course, uh, like Nidhi just mentioned, there are concerns that stock market prices are uh, have a tendency to be manipulated. So when we look at all the previous studies that ask this question, that if you have two different measures and how we can use it, most of the previous studies have focused on analyzing and predicting credit distress using both accounting data and market variables. Our focus is going to shift from the level of the accounting information or the level or the pro of the probability to default to asking, can we make a statement about how once we observed a particular probability of default or a particular level of financial health, can we say how it's going to change over a period of time? So the premise is that Irrespective of the level of the market-based distance to default, if we see that for a firm, there's a very large drop or a very large increase in this distance to default over a period of time, it could be indicative of a change in the financial health of that firm, and it's likely to lead to a change in credit rating at, at a future date. So our approach was, look, because we're looking at market-based prices for one measure of uh, financial health, we are going to have a focus for these firms. We are going to collect the credit ratings across time. And we will look at the credit ratings and how they've changed. And in parallel, we are going to look at the distance to default for all of these firms. And this we will be able to do at the frequency of daily changes. Once we do this, we've got two time series. One is the time series of changes in credit rating. The other is the time series of changes in distant to default. And we are going to evaluate whether there's a relationship between the two, which one of it responds more rapidly to uh, information about changes in health of the firm. And we're going to do this in two ways. One is a simple event study. And the second is to do it through the rigor of a logic model, which is going to ask, was there a downgrade or was there not? And just to summarize quickly before uh, I go into the paper so that if I run out of time, you get a sense of what we find. We find that there is significant evidence that changes in the distance to default. And this can be the change in the distance to default month or for some firms all the way up to the last two years can indicate a credit rating downgrade. So the focus in this presentation as of right now, although you can do it for all kinds of rating changes, is looking at whether a credit rating downgrade happens. And this effect that there are there is a link between uh, an early evidence of change in DTD telling you something about a credit rating downgrade holds across firms of different size. So we control for size. We control for all kinds of accounting ratios. Uh, the only thing that doesn't really seem to matter too much is years, <clears throat> year fixed effects, which we use to try to capture macroeconomic effects. But we find that in addition to the change in the DTD, when we also change in, uh, when we also use information about the firm, uh, for example, Arkaja talked about a cross-sectional variation. When we include information about, uh, say, the industry, 
to uh, enhancing the probability with which uh, we can say that there will be a credit rating downgrade in the future. Our estimations also show that uh, public sector enterprises, that's PSCs, tend to have a lower probability of credit rating downgrade in the overall sample. So this is what we find. And now let me go into describing what we are doing in the, day, uh, in the paper. So let's go through a little bit of the description of the data first. Uh, the data is, as I said, uh, we look at both the National Stock Exchange and the Bombay Stock Exchange for the firms that are listed. Of course, we like to see firms that are traded reasonably frequently. So that is a filtering criterion. There's a period of study uh, that we are focusing on in this presentation and for the overall paper is looking at January 2009 to September 2020. We do have data from 1998 for credit ratings. The number of ratings per year for this period from 98 to 2009 tends to be less than 1,000 ratings each year. So, but when you uh, when we go to the uh, years after, we see that there are a significantly larger number of ratings. The source of our data is the CMI prowess data set, and we look at rating agents ratings from rating agencies. Uh, that are in the list in front of you. Now, out of these seven rating agencies, CARE, Crystal, and ICRA uh, represent 86%. In fact, Crystal uh, represents more than 40% of the ratings, but we take all the ratings. We don't ignore the smaller ones because they could have different models in how they're coming up with the ratings. Now, on the slide in front of you, you get a snapshot of what kinds of ratings. Now, we're not talking about specific rating categories. We're just saying that in the year 2009, if you look at all the instruments that are available, how upgraded, how many were downgraded, and how many were reaffirmed. Uh, the total number of ratings in 2009 was 3,766. By the time you come to 2019, which is the pre-pandemic year, you see that it's ballooned up to about 11,000 ratings in the entire year. So this is a, an economy that's churning out a lot of uh, ratings because there are a lot of instruments. I forgot to mention that the number of unique firms in our sample is about 2,500. And all of the instruments across all of these firms are what we're looking at in this uh, sample. So you can see that most of the ratings are reaffirmations, but there's a significant number of firms that are downgraded or number of instruments that are downgraded. So we're not looking at a small data set when we are trying to fit the models. Here is a table that shows you a bit of a breakup across different kinds of uh, ratings and how they have been downgraded. So the top row is for the bonds had ratings across all the credit rating agencies, which can be categorized as highest safety, right? These are your triple A's and whatever it is, the, the rating that different credit rating agencies give. So that's about 24% of the data, but we have 6% or 7% of the data where we can see that the downgrade has gone into a default status, right? So that's how you would read this table. So we have a nice representation across all kinds of credit rating categories in this uh, data set that we're going to sample. And uh, finally, in this table, I'm just showing you some sample characteristics of changes in the DTD and changes in the accounting ratios of the firms, uh, just to give you a sense of what we're looking at here. The uh, changes in DTD, uh, the way that you read the first row is Delta DTD over one month. That is, on the date of the credit rating, uh, ch uh, credit rating change, vis -vis that date, what was the of the change that you saw uh, one month previously? The last one is actually looking at uh, if from with respect to the rate uh, date of the credit rating change. If I looked at the DTD six months ago versus 12 months ago, what was the information that I had in the change in the DTD six months earlier? Right, And you can see that the mean will tell you that uh, the magnitude of the change is small, but there are some instruments that are actually showing significantly high uh, drops. Like there is, a, a, for all of you who are not familiar with what is the typical range that you can see of a DTD, it's a number that goes uh, from zero, which is a defaulted firm, all the way up to uh, five, six, seven, eight, right? So when you see that there is an instrument that has gone through a drop of about 1.8, or a two, which is the 12 month change that you can see as the minimum value um, in the table, that's a significant uh, 
deterioration of the financial health of the firm. Uh, the accounting ratios also tell you some information about the sample. Now I shall uh, tell you a little bit of the, about the analysis. As I said, we use two approaches. One is an event study and the other is a logit uh, analysis, logit model analysis. For the event study, we take the date of the rating uh, downgrade. And this uh, uh, talk, I'm just going to focus on the event of a rating downgrade. Uh, that is the date which is equal to zero, right? And then I'm going to look at uh, 500 days before and 500 days after in terms of what is the changes that we can observe of the DTD. That's the distance from default. Remember, the distance from default is calculated at a daily frequency. So 500 days is typically about two years before and two years after. Now, we may all laugh and say, ha, huh, I mean, how is it possible that the market is showing that the DTD is calculating from two years ago and uh, the frequency is in capturing it? But that's what we're going to test here, right? And we're being fair. We're going to say we're just uh, we're not just going to look at the period before the downgrade. We're also going to look at the period after the downgrade to ask, as I said, the information efficiency question, which is should be a two way street. Number one. Is there some information that is being captured by changes in the distance to default that feeds into or predates the change? The, in the rating and also in the distance to default after the rating has happened, rating change has happened. Okay, so our inference will be that if there's a significant drop in the average DTD before the rating downgrade, it implies that the DTD has captured information before the rating has. And sorry, sorry hi Susan. Yeah, I've got five five more minutes to go. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, not a problem, right? Uh, and this is what we see, right? So the uh, reasonably clear because it's a simple event study. What we do is take all the instruments and line it up with respect to the date on which they saw a rating downgrade. And for each of those firms, we're just looking at the changes in the DTD. And this is. There are two graphs on this slide. The first graph that is uh, labeled A is for all the firms which saw a rating downgrade, right? So the center of the graph at zero is the date on which the credit rating downgrade happened. And they are all the way from two years before to today. And you can see that across the board, when there is a downgraded firm, the DTD is responding and telling you that something's going wrong because it's trending downwards. Just look at in stark contrast for those firms where there was a reaffirmation of credit status at the date of the rating uh, change. And you'll see that the DTD is pretty flat, except for the bonds firm to be defaulted bonds, right? So that's where you can see the bottom line for the second graph. Once we see that there appears to be information that the DTD is capturing before there's a change in the rating, and in this case, it's about rating downgrades, we're going to put it into a logic model where we're looking at the probability of YT, which is if a rating is downgraded at time T, and if it's not, then it's going to be zero. And we're going to look at it, this probability, as a function of changes in the DTD over various periods of time. Okay? We're going to do two things. Number one, we're going to ask, when there was a change with respect to the past today, is it important or did it, would it have contributed information to the probability of a downgrade? The second one we're going to ask is, uh, did different uh, chunks of time changes, did that matter? So what you see on the graph in front of you is the first question. We are looking at the probability of a rating downgrade. See that there are single models where we are running uh, to see whether the change in DTD from one month ago, three months ago, six months ago, and 12 months ago, did it matter? And we can see that all across the board, these DTD changes from the past, with respect to the past, it has contributed to the probability of a credit rating downgrade. Okay. We ask about identifying the horizon where we're looking at not just the entire period vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the point of the rating downgrade, but saying that with respect to today, if I looked at one month ago, what was the change in the DTD? That's going to be your delta DTD underscore 3M minus 1M, right? And you see that even that coefficient is positive. The last column is interesting. That is model five, where we ask which is the most important. So we are looking at the magnitude of the coefficient and we actually see that the most recent period that's the last one month change actually has got the largest 
But we can't ignore the others because they are all contributory factors. We're going to do some robustness checks. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to control for firm specific factors where we're looking at size, because size is always important, right? Age, the industry, and various accounting ratios. And in this case, we're looking at the last available value of these variables as of the date of the credit event. We're also going to control for credit instruments, right? So who was the rating Rating agency. What was the rating instrument that you found, and what was the rating at the time of the downgrade? So we don't see what was the rating before. We just see what the rating was uh, downgraded to. And finally, we look at year fixed effects to control for macroeconomic fluctuations. And what you see in the screen in front of you, and I know that this is really small, and this is what always happens when you have panel data uh, regressions, is that uh, you know there are too many numbers. Nice is that across the board. For all of these different models, even as we uh, control for various other firm-specific factors, the changes in the DTD remain uh, significant, right? They are significant and they are positive. You will notice in column nine, the amounts or the magnitudes have changed somewhat, but all of them remain positive and significant. So what we're going to summarize as saying is that both the event study and the logit estimations point that Changes in the DTD, which take place before the change in the credit rating downgrade, does appear to capture information about deterioration in the firm's financial health. All across, when you look at uh, one year before or six, uh, six months before, it does appear to contribute to the fact that there is going to be a credit rating downgrade. But the largest piece or the most, uh, the largest amount magnitude is in the DTD of the most recent one month. This remains uh, robust even when you add firm features and accounting variables, uh, which suggests that there is scope to consider a building a prediction model, right? So if there is information that's showing up in the DTD, can we now see whether there is a prediction model that we can develop to say, I see that there is a change in the DTD. Can we predict that for a firm with a given instrument that has a particular rating, in the next one month or two months, is it going to uh, see a, a rating downgrade? That's not something that we've done so far. And that's where I'm going to talk a little bit about the extensions to this work, uh, because we think that this is useful and interesting information, but there is work to be done. So number one, uh, do public sector firms have uh, a different behavior in terms of uh, credit rating downgrade vis-a-vis -vis their uh, distance to default measures? Because they have dominant as a majority shareholder, right? And if the is the state, then uh, does that change uh, how we see changes in DTD and credit ratings? And by the way, the answer is that the DTD changes does have some information about deteriorating financial health. But overall, compared with private sector firms, public sector firms have got a much lower probability of a rating downgrade. I've put here or lower overall probability of default, but that's not true. Uh, what I should have said is it has a lower chance of seeing a credit rating downgrade. Now, in this paper so far, we see that there is evidence, strong evidence, that is information about future rating changes that is captured in changes in DTD. Uh, is there information about changes in DTD after the change in credit ratings? It's not something we have done yet. That is what we are working on next. And what we would like to do is uh, augment the econometric robustness by considering other econometric appro approaches that test information efficiency, right? Things like range of causality, looking at lead lag relationships between rating changes and DTD before and after, and uh, something that we've used in the past, which is Hasbrook's information share. Next, there is uh, the fact that credit rating downgrades are done for all instruments of the firm at the same time, right? So when a credit rating agency does a downgrade, it typically does the same action for all the instruments. So then the question is, is there a link between the magnitude of the change in the DTD and the number of grades in the rating can change by? So you start with triple B. Are you going to go down to default or are you going to go down to B minus? That is something, and is that being captured by the magnitude of the change in the DTD? That's a question that we still have an answer, and that is potential research going forward. And finally, of course, is there a prediction model for credit rating changes? Because we can observe the DTD and the credit rating changes respond far slower. 
was my talk. Thank you. I hope it was useful. I look forward to comments and questions. Thank, thank you, Susan. It was wonderful, and especially it kind of speaks to the uh, the concern that whether the credit rating agencies are overrated, whether these things even matter or not. So on that, thank you so much for sharing the insight. Uh, I think we have uh, a few uh, uh, clarification questions, if you don't mind. Okay. So uh, uh, the question is, doesn't credit risk models already use the distance to default model as one of the methods to arrive at credit rating? For instance, Moody KMV is one such tool which is sold by Moody's to banks and lenders to do credit rating, and it is an integral part of their own rating mechanism. It uses a model very similar to distance to default. So it sounds more like a complementary than a substitute of model. So what do you have? What do you want to say to that? I mean, I agree, right? The KMV paper and the model has been around for the last maybe two decades. There have been changes that automatically suggest that these are incorporated. So when we look at uh, the data, though, we should find that this effect has gone away because uh, as soon as they see these kinds of changes in the DTD, one presumes that they will go out and do a credit rating change. Now, for some reason, and we do not know why, right? There could be all kinds of transaction costs and market frictions that do not permit the credit rating agency to make that rating change when they see a downgrade happen that is imminent. This is a puzzle for the credit rating agencies. What we can do is to see whether this the strength of the relationship between the rating, uh, the DTD changes and the credit rating agencies uh, rating changes has that changed through time. So right now we are uh, we are not we are not finding a year's fixed effect. So we are not seeing that in a particular year the effect has gone down or up. But it's a uh, some worry about. And what we would like to do is break up the period from 2009 to 2020 into different pieces and say, when we estimate these models, are we seeing the magnitude of the coefficients change? Our blunt sense is that not, because it's so strong, right? The coefficient just comes up again and again, but perhaps the magnitude does change. I would think that if it doesn't matter, all these coefficients should go to zero, they should become insignificant. It's not. So there is something that is a puzzle. It could just be market frictions, um, maybe it's a pricing model that they can't charge for. I, I, so I, I honestly don't know. And it's something no, no. that is a good question to ask a credit rating agency. Okay. Second question is, so I'm wondering that distance to default is, so higher the distance to default, that's a good thing for a firm. Is that not yeah. right? Yes. So uh, interpreting your coefficient, so if distance to default increases, because that's what your delta is capturing, if I'm right, mm -hmm. then the probability of credit downgrading uh, increases. Now, that seems quite opposite of what you just showed. I'm not sure. What am I missing? Yeah, so, uh, no, no, that's a, that's a good point. Um, I think that uh, I should look at the probability of default. Uh, where's my co-author? Has she gone away? Yeah, she has. Yeah, she had to leave. Uh, yeah. So no, I will look at it. I think that uh, what we found was that uh, the information is strong. It could be in the way in which we uh, modeled or calculated the numbers. So uh, what I think is that there is a change in the DTD, which is a drop, and the positive coefficient is capturing it as going down. So you, in that case, probably you're ignoring where the distance to default actually increases. So firms become safer. You don't care about those. Yeah. You only care about, okay, that might explain the coefficients. Yeah. So in, in that case, won't the difference in difference kind of setting serve you better to for a causal interpretation? So we don't, we are not doing causal interpretation here, right? We're just looking at the relationship between one thing and the other. So I think that the next step becomes more of a causal interpretation. Because we, at the, at the first cut, uh, it's pretty difficult to set up causal because we're going to have to look at two firms which are alike in terms of the financial health. One of them goes through a downgrade and one of them does not. And we'd like to be able to say, I can see the DTD for both, yeah. but it doesn't happen. Now, because the credit rating agencies do not have a calendar on which they regularly rate these instruments. Okay. Um, it's very difficult to set up a causal study, right? Um, oh, fair. It's, not, it's not clear to us that if even if we were to locate a firm, which is a like firm, 
should be able to see the credit rating of that instrument or that firm at that point in time when the second firm has got a rating change based on what based on what you just uh, i think what you discussed in the beginning that not all drop is significant so let's say that not all change in the distance to default would matter would be material in the same to the same extent and if that is the case maybe you can treat the firms where distance to default changes is large becomes the treatment group and where the treat distance to default change is small yeah, no no of course right but the thing is what is it that we are trying to predict so we would try to say that there would be a rating downgrade that happens for one set of firms and not for the other or vice versa right yeah, yeah. the problem is that we don't control the date or the observation of the credit rating we can see the dtd we can calculate something like an altman z score mm -hmm. right? because we see the accounting ratios yeah. but we don't know what fair enough yeah i i see there are data constraints yeah because i mean for sure. yeah, yeah for, for sure, sure right? because that's what we're trying to predict so your prediction model so we're going to sell you a prediction model you're the bank you have these bunch of loans to firms what you'd like to figure out is that your regulator is going to come to you and say put up provisions because the credit rating has slipped from investment grade to a non investment grade however no, the credit rating agency doesn't give you a rating on a day to day basis for all of your firms so you're stuck right then you'll have to look for alternative measures saying i see that the dtd of this firm is on a slippery path down this one is not going to be rated anytime soon because ratings typically come on a six month cycle right and right, which fair. bank wants to provide proactively right yeah. they would like to put it no, out it, it happens way less frequently i totally that's agree. it that's it and so I, that's where i think the causal inference is different we need to do some predictions but even that is difficult because Give, even that is very interesting it doesn't have to be causal but the finding itself is very interesting no i agree i agree right so this thank is you. i agree all right thank you thank you so much dr thomas it was really insightful and wonderful discussion and thank presentation you. Yeah. So uh, next is uh, next uh, presentation is uh, uh, from uh, Mr. Srinivas Mahapatra. So given the growing concerns around banks' financial health, the next top topic is as relevant as it gets. So I would like to invite now Srinivas Mahapatra, who is an FPM student at uh, Indian School of Business, to present cleaning up distressed banks: the prompt corrective corrective action approach. Mr. Mahapatra, uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, you you're yeah. yes, you're right. audible. Yes, you're audible. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers for giving us an opportunity to present our paper. Uh, right. So uh, the paper is titled as uh, "Preventing Borrower Runs: The Prompt Corrective Action Approach." Uh, it is co-authored with Nishant Kashyap and Professor Prasanna Tantri from ISB. Uh, so this is the summary snap of you know of of, of what we have. Uh, the motivation of this paper comes from the fact that borrower runs are pretty much prevalent in india borrower runs is a little different from uh, you know the bank runs that we observe borrower run is the phenomenon where uh, where actually a borrower strategically defaults to a bank which is not performing well i'll talk about it in detail in the next slide so uh, our main research question is centered around uh, does regulatory intervention in the form of a pca prompt corrective action actually helps reverse borrower run um, there is already some literature around uh, you know a prompt corrective action which was which was implemented in us and it how it helped uh, you know uh, improve the banking system and all but focusing on borrower run has not been done that's what we have focused on here our main results uh, talks about that uh, you know pca implementation actually reduces borrower run by reduction in strategic defaults and 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 uh, this default in uh, decrease in default is actually observed in uh, in in jurisdictions which have low court efficiency and it is observed in both uh, distress as well as healthy borrowers all right uh, so going forward i'll, I'll first explain the borrower and phenomenon so borrower and phenomenon uh, uh, this is a theory paper by bond and rai 2009 where they talk about you know how borrowers default on lenders who who uh, where they observe that lot of other borrowers are also defaulting on the same lender in in such a scenario what happens is the value of the continued relationship with such a lender reduce and the borrower kind of strategically defaults on such lenders uh, this was the theoretical setting 
it was observed pretty cleanly in a paper by Shantali, Stakini, and Strahan in the Italian setting. It's a JF paper where they uh, where this uh, where they established empirically that the probability of late repayment is actually positively associated with the proportion of bad loans that are present in the bank's portfolio. In fact, they find it in within a firm. You know, if you have exposure to two different banks, the firm kind of strategically defaults to the bank which has a higher proportion of bad loans as compared to the other bank. Uh, they also observe that, uh, you know, they kind of conclude that this kind of a default is strategic and not actually, you know, default because of the distress of the firm because they, they find a couple of, uh, you know, channels. One is they find that it is, these defaults are more prominent in jurisdictions with inefficient uh, judicial enforcement. And the other thing is they find that these strategic defaults are not just limited to borrowers who are distressed. It is also very much prevalent in borrowers who have, uh, you know, who have uh, good operating performance, good interest coverage ratio. And all. So uh, taking a cue from this, first we try to find out whether the borrower run phenomenon is prevalent in India or not. So we uh, try to replicate the exact specification which they have. We take the, you know, uh, bank firm loan data from Ministry of Corporate Affairs, and then we try to build uh, the proportion of uh, bank uh, loans which are given to, you know, distressed borrowers. Distressed borrowers here means borrowers which have an interest cover ratio of less than one. We have taken that definition. And we find that, um, like uh, Chantilly et al. find in Italy, even here we see that there's a significant positive association uh, in of uh, uh, of uh, defaults and the proportion of uh, bad loans in a bank's uh, book, and and this, this implies borrower run because we also do it in you know within a firm year observation. We have used firm and year fixed effect. So uh, so we are actually uh, asking the question whether within a firm whether the firm is defaulting more to a borrower which is uh, which is having a high proportion of bad loans as compared to a uh, uh, sorry, if uh, within a firm, if the borrower is uh, defaulting more to a creditor, which is having a high proportion of bad loans as compared to a creditor, which has a low proportion of, uh, you know, uh, bad loans. And, and that's what we find. Uh, so now going ahead, I'll, I'll talk about a little about the institutional setup, then I'll talk about the main hypothesis. The prompt corrective action, this was, uh, you know, um, uh, this was a major step in Indian banking and it was implemented in 2018. Uh, so the primary objective of this was to identify banks which are under distress and to ensure that you know uh, have recapitalization plan, kind of ensure uh, you know put restrictions on their lending and try to make the balance sheet better and then remove them from the PCA. So uh, within, in fact, in 2018, if I'm correct, there were 11 banks which are put under PCA. Uh, so the PCA regime they had a criteria uh, based on five financial parameters, accounting or regulatory parameters, you can say. Uh, and if any each, any one of these parameter was violated, the bank was put under PCA. Uh, so you can see, you know, uh, there are different levels of threshold also. The, the breach, uh, basically two and three are more uh, aggressive breaches. And, um, uh, and, and and the parameters pretty much self-explanatory. You have uh, capital education ratio, the CET1 ratio, uh, net NPA ratio, uh, leverage as measured by Basel three. And then whether you have a consecutive uh, two or three year loss. Now, uh, the restrictions that come uh, as part of PCA was under level one, level one breach, we, we saw all the, uh, all the banks which actually breached level one. And we found that almost all of them were, 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 were uh, not put under PCA and were just relieved with some minor penalties. It was not strictly enforced. But any bank which breached level two or higher, they were actually put under PCA. Uh, Direct as well as indirect lending comes were imposed. Uh, you know, provisions, uh, higher provisioning norms were imposed. And there were also strict monitoring, quarter on quarter strict monitoring. So uh, it is fair to say that level two or higher breach is strictly enforced. In fact, this is what is uh, giving us an identification for our you know, uh, empirical setup. Uh, also, just to casually note it, it's not the first time that uh, prompt corrective action was implemented in India. In 2002 to 2017 also, there was one regime. But it was very mild. It didn't have any basal measures. Then, uh, you know, uh, the banks were also allowed due to the regulatory for forbearance regime, which we had before 2016. Banks were allowed to, you know, restructure. And they uh, it's not necessary that they will always put the uh, true NPA. But in the new regime, they added those uh, missing pieces, the, uh, the basal three measures, 
as well as uh, if you remember from 2016 onwards there was this asset quality review exercise which was started by rbi now that ensured that there was a comprehensive audit by rbi on top of the annual report or the you know financial statement that was presented by the bank and they used to you know revalidate how much np it should be and actually many banks were caught red handed especially in the first year so this kind of ensures that banks do not misreport to a large extent and don't just evade pc uh coming to our main hypothesis regarding pc and borrower run uh, uh we we think of it as a you know ex ante there's a uh, there is a tension in the hypothesis that uh, either pca can exaggerate or you know kind of ameliorate uh, your borrower run phenomenon on one hand we are aware that once a bank goes under the pca framework it will it will have a direct and indirect uh, lending curves so once you have that uh, lending curves the uh, the 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 value of the lending relationship to, for the borrower goes down because it will be difficult to get a loan from this uh, you know from this lender in the future so it is possible that uh, the threshold for borrower runs uh, decreases and the borrower run might actually increase on the other hand you also you have this regulatory oversight that could increase the probability of uh, turnaround of banks the, the purpose of this uh, uh, you know pca was to actually overhaul the banks and to make them uh, make the balance sheet even better so that could increase the value of continuing relationship for borrowers especially the borrowers who have who who plan on a long term relationship uh, additionally increased rbi monitoring on pca banks would also you know discourage the borrowers from coming under the lens of rbi and may be declared as a willful defaulter or so so that would also discourage uh, defaulting so the other side of the hypothesis talks about uh, that uh, the uh, the pca could actually lower the tendency of firms to default on pca bank so extent it is not clear which we try to uh, you know test empirically now our, our empirical strategy as i mentioned earlier the pc is strictly enforced so we find out the level to threshold and we use a sharp regression discontinuity design around a you know narrow cut off of the uh, threshold uh, additionally one of the major drawbacks of any rd design is that uh, there might be some self selection concerns so we definitely do a mccready test which is a prerequisite for a rd i'll show you later but on top of that we should also remember that aqr was being conducted by rbi and the manipulation of nps had gone down drastically so that actually mitigates the any self uh, selection bias like you know one bank deliberately trying to you know manipulate the number and try to come into the control group rather than the treatment group other identification concerns are uh, there is a possibility that borrowers borrowing from pca banks could be systematically different from borrowers borrowing from non pca banks and that could drive our results but this also we mitigate uh, one thing we do is we take a very narrow band and we also you know kind of differ it and we show that you know our results hold second thing is we include although rd doesn't required firm fixed fx we use firm fixed fx because what it uh, what it does it is now for the same firm we are comparing whether you know how it behaves towards the pca bank as compared to the non pca bank so we use on top of that we also use firm fixed fx uh regarding the rd implementation it's not a straight forward implementation because you have uh, multiple criteria so each of these criteria the variables uh, the parameters we convert them into running variable we just standardize them around the cutoff of zero we ensure that a positive score uh, you know uh, means a pca violation and a negative score is means the bank hasn't violated a pca with respect to that particular parameter then all this five standardized score we bind them into a single score which is a pca score we use the method which uh, which has been used by manchiraju and rajgopal uh, it's a jar paper where they have used multiple criteria accounting criteria and that actually takes some motivation from riordan and robinson which talks about you know multiple uh, triggers for uh, you know an event uh, so here at the pca score we take the minimum of the positive score if the bank breaches or if the bank doesn't breach then we take the maximum of the negative scores in other words uh, we are just taking the scores which are very close to the uh you know cut off that actually is in the essence of rd because rd suggests that you should exclude extreme financial parameters you should only look at uh, uh, variables which are very close to the cut off uh, so using this rd uh, using this uh, pca score uh, the binding score uh, we use an rd specification this is a simple rd specification uh, you have the treated variable the uh, the uh, the running variable and the interaction of treated and running variable and our uh, coefficient of interest is the treated variable which talks about the uh, jump in the intercept okay if there is an effect 
Uh, so, uh, before going to our main test, we first conduct a first stage test. In the first stage test, uh, check. Sorry. Just a second. So, in the first stage test, we just check whether there is an impact on lending. So, ex ante, we are aware that uh, lending has been impacted. So, here we clearly see that lending has decreased, the TTA coefficient. So, that was, uh, that, that was obvious. Uh, next, we do our main result. Now, we take our uh, dependent variable as default. Uh, and uh, we check what happens to default uh, for the treated banks vis-a-vis -vis the you know uh, control banks. So if we find that firms actually the negative coefficient suggests that firms actually selectively default to PCA banks compared to non-PCA banks. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, this this coefficient of which we have you know 5.6 percent of decrease in default is actually very significant because. Uh, the unconditional uh, rate of default in our sample stands at eight percent. So it, it it is it is close to about ninety percent of uh, you know uh, the default that we observe unconditionally. And we then vary the bandwidth, vary the bandwidth from minus point one to point one to minus point one two five to point one two five, then minus point one five to one point one five. Of course, as we go farther, uh, that is uh, natural characteristics of uh, RD that you know generalizability becomes a concern. But you see our results, you know, kind of uh, hold together. Uh, one primary concern of this could be uh, the behavior towards government banks because uh, you know uh, the the borrowers do uh, understand that you know most of the times government banks are actually uh, bailed out by the government so the the uh, the borrower default uh, sorry the borrower run behavior might be different here so what we do is we limit our data to uh, to observations which in the pre period have relationships from public sector bank and when then we do redo our test the results are presented in panel b as you can see the results are even much stronger actually so in essence what we say is pca appears to re reduce default on pca banks and thus averts borrower runs on these banks then we do a host of uh, robustness tests the first prerequisite comes from the mccrary test where you see whether there is a change in density of uh, you know the running variable uh, below and above the cutoff and we find that the T stat is uh, statistically highly insignificant. So we can rule out any evidence of manipulation. In fact, uh, we also take comfort from the fact that uh, AQR was in place from, you know, uh, during our sample period. So the probability of uh, you know, manipulating these numbers would be pretty low. Another robustness we do is uh, there could also be concerns that the characteristics of forms which are there on the left side and the right side are perhaps different, and that's why it is uh, you know it is it is showing a different result in defaults in both the sides. Uh, so we also uh, replicate our RD based on some firm characteristics. We take sales growth, we take uh, operating uh, performances, and we take solvency measures, and we find that there is no change. So the difference in default across the cutoff is not a reflection of systematically different forms. Next, we also apply the robust RD methodology. It is a methodology devised by Kalonico et al. Uh, in their 2014 econometric paper. And this actually takes care of biasnesses of uh, you know, various bandwidth selection. So it throws out its own bandwidth, which is suitable and which is bias and variance adjusted. And, it also, and we also repeat it for our own bandwidth. And we see that the results primarily still hold. Uh, Hi, Srinivas, you have got yeah. five more minutes. Thank you. Correct. Thank you. Sorry about the interruption. Uh, next, uh, robustness test is we check it for higher degree of polynomials. The concern here is that the true relation between the default and the running variable is act might be nonlinear. So we do uh, you know second order, third order degree polynomial, and, and the results still. Uh, next, next we try to establish uh, whether the reduction in default is actually reduction in strategic default or not. So uh, recall what I had mentioned earlier about the uh, you know Strahan paper. It says that. Uh, you know, this uh, borrow run actually happens more primarily in areas which have lower legal efficiencies and uh, it happens for both healthy and troubled forms. So if PCA reduces strategic default, then we should see reversal of, uh, you know, the coefficients in these parameters. So we use a triple interaction where you use a firm level indicator. The first column is for quote inefficiency where the firm level indicator is one if the firm lies in a uh, in a jurisdiction which has high code inefficiency, and there we find that exactly our 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 uh, you know reduction in strategic default actually comes from uh, areas with higher code inefficiency. Similarly, we take a uh, couple of measures for uh, you know firms in distress. We take uh, 
uh, operating, uh, uh, you know, there is a change in EBIT or there is a drastic decrease in tax, all those measures. And we still find that uh, this interaction is, in, is, is not negative significant, but this, uh, uh, this primary coefficient which is treated, it is still negative significant. That means the deduction which is happening in, in default is equally coming from both good and bad firms. And, and, and that actually more kind of stresses our point that it is, it is actually a reduction in strategic default. Next, we try to question what are the kind of firms which would still go ahead and do strategic default. Now, for that, we take uh, indicators to identify firms which have highly credit constrained or the firms which have high growth. Now, these are the firms which won't value long-term relationship with bank because they are in immediate need of credit. So in these banks, we should not accept a, 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 a reversal in uh, you know, a default. And that's what exactly we find. Actually, it is exactly offset. If you see, treat into firm level indicator, you have a positive coefficient. And interestingly, it is almost equivalent to the you know, negative coefficient that you see for the other non-credit constrained firms. So it, it, it suggests that the strategy, reduction in strategic default doesn't happen for firms which are in immediate need of credit. Overall, uh, the summary is uh, we first established that borrower run is prevalent in India uh, and the implementation of PCA framework reverses borrower run. This reversal is actually driven by reduction in strategic default because it is driven by firms which are located in inefficient code jurisdiction and it is witnessed in both good and bad firms. However, the reversal of borrower run is not witnessed in firms which are highly credit constrained or which have a high growth rate. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to questions and suggestions. Thank you so much, Srinivas. That was a, a very well, well within the time presentation. I really appreciate it. And it's very relevant and uh, given the current scenario of uh, borrower run and high NPA status, uh, bank status of India, that's very concerning. Uh, so a few clarification questions uh, uh, from myself and audience both. So how do you estimate strategic default? Because I understand when a default is visible, but what is the precise measurement that okay. you use in your strategic default measure? Right. So we use the strategic default definition, which has been used by, you know, Strahan. So they term that, you know, uh, if we observe a default, it could be very well due to, you know, uh, that the firm is in distress. But if you see a default, which is happening, uh, you know, uh, within a firm, towards bank and he's selectively defaulting to somebody and it is happening even if the firm is in is having a good solvency good profitability measure then he terms it as strategy default so here we you know that's why we show that you know on the last last one of the tables where i show that you know even uh, it 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 is within a firm uh, that they selectively defaulting to a bank and it happens irrespective of whether the firm is having a icr more than one or less than one in fact even if in high icr sometimes they are defaulting so that that points to strategic default. That's okay. a, a way which we have taken from the, uh, you know, uh, strand paper. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, how do you measure the variation in legal enforcement? All right. So we, that yeah, yeah. We, uh, we, we take a, another GF paper. I forget that. But what they have, uh, they have done is they have taken the average years of um, it takes to solve a uh, civil case in the high courts of those jurisdictions. So we take the, uh, you know, uh, we, we take the registered uh, address, the state, and then we take the average, uh, you know, the pendency rate, or you can say how much delay those high courts do. And we classify them into medians and tercials, and we, uh, you know, take uh, high legal efficiency or low legal efficiency. This is actually, I think, in similar to what Ponticelli and Alankar and few other things. So basically, yeah, you have the uh, state. If I can jump in here, it's yeah, a sure. Bohem and Overfield uh, paper in, right. from QJ. It's a 2020 paper. So they have used High Court Efficiency of India. Uh, so we have taken the data from their paper. So you look at the headquarters states and then you look at the cases yes, on there. Yes. What kind of variation do you observe in this data? Yeah, there's this quite a bit of variation. Uh, uh, I don't have the table, but yeah. States on the states, top? Uh, Is that the worst doing states? In, uh, yeah, there are quite a few it. worst doing states. Um, I don't want to... I think UP, Bihar, yeah. uh, Jharkhand, yeah. these... And Odisha are doing that. Okay. Yeah. 
first and the good ones so are it's a, in the in the uh, bohem and overfield paper there's a nice graph about it where you can see a a, a, a huge separation between the first performing and uh, it's it's a very polar polarized if you look at that graph yeah they have this graph and uh, okay it looks like this is the most in, one of the most interesting aspect uh, so aspect of the paper so uh, another uh, further clarification question on that is uh, uh, how many days of pendencies do you observe and if you could please cite the reference for for this uh, for the paper? i'll i don't have the data right now but yeah i have it in the okay nishant uh, you uh, nishant has replied okay great so any a, a, any recollection on what kind of pendency days of pendency do you observe in your data when uh, when you talk about legal enforcement uh, it was in years i think suppose it was somewhere like i don't remember the average i think average was somewhere around 4 or 5 years okay and it it was as high as i think 13 14 years somewhere. So uh, another question we have from audience is at what level of stress for the lender do you start to observe strategic default and what does the literature say about the level? Uh, so we have uh, the strategic default that we did was, uh, uh, yeah, right. So I think I'll have to go to the coefficients that I have. Uh, so, uh, we I think for one standard deviation of increase in uh, uh, just let me correct. Okay, so we went we, uh, for one standard deviation in increase in you know troubled firm share in a bank's portfolio in the previous year it is associated with eight point five percent higher default com compared to the unconditional. Deal. That's okay. the magnitude of that first table where I where we showed you know the borrow and phenomenon exists. Okay, so uh, uh, the, uh, I'm just wondering that, uh, for example, before uh, before a firm has decided to default, even if it's tragic default, they must have signed some debt covenant contract with the bank. So, what happens to those debt covenants? They would trigger way before they have defaulted on those loans, right? And if it's particularly a secured loan, that would behave differently from an uh, in comparison to unsecured loan. Because then you have a collateral to seize, put it in auction, etc. Then that strategy default might not look like a very good choice. Yeah, so do you uh, see a kind of a difference in? Yeah. So that that's where it comes from. I mean, the actual setting is from Italy, where even legal code of postponement is low. So, uh, no, is is low. So uh, say so the so we, uh, no, it it actually happens in areas where the legal enforcement is low. Low. So okay. even even in India, I don't think you know in uh, India has a. Uh, even if you talk about the ranking of India in terms of legal enforcement, although in terms of uh, conducting business, it is it has improved by leaps and bounds, some I think 50 or 60. In terms of uh, legal enforcement, we are ranked at out of some 200 odd uh, uh, countries, we are at some 190. Uh, no, and it's, it's, it's a given fact that even, you know, even, uh, even though somebody has declared as default and, default and civil default list, it takes a lot of time to recover it. So, uh, so RKC has changed that about banks, right? Especially for uh, the but, st of, but, but still, uh, I, think, loans. I agree. Even IBC has changed that, but but still, I think uh, you know, uh, not all the cases go to uh, you know. Uh, uh, we we still see a lot of default. It's it's okay. not. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we we are taking default from the civil file suits, and uh, we also find that you know a lot of cases. Uh, kind of uh, breach these, uh, like ICR less than one is very common one, which we can at least, you know, even if we don't have the data on covenants, we can check. There are a lot of firms which do that and it's not like everybody is taken to default. That is very much common in countries like I think in India. Would it not be better to look at debt recovery tribunal data instead of civil data? Because there is the, uh, there is the very specific uh, codes which are dedicated for the, especially for the debt recovery, DRD. Act yeah, but but, right? but yeah, it, but it has little to do with the civil courts uh, or cases that you have talked about. But uh, but don't the DRT also come under the uh, year of the? It is a precedent to Sarfesi and then precedent to all the bankruptcy. Yeah. Uh, Since so, you're talking about specifically about the defaults and uh, when it comes to secured loans and uh, you know seizing of the property or the or the uh, especially in K collateral then the cases tend to go to DRT first uh, before it gets challenged anywhere else. So since you are looking at the 
legal aspect of it. I think the more accurate measure, if you're told you have the data, I understand there could be. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I think the DRT data, somebody, uh, there was another, I think, QJ paper which had done that. Um, I can check that, but I think the if I rank them in terms of DRT efficiency and high court, civil court efficiency, I think it comes mm-hmm. same. I had okay. not checked it in this paper, but in, in another one I had checked it. And uh, the ranking of the you know, states still don't change. It's the same. Uh, because, see, I mean, in fact, even DRT also, it, it borrows, I think, most of the uh, uh, most of the legal infrastructure from the from the from that from that particular state. In fact, I have also one, made one comparison. The efficiency of even high courts and subordinate courts is same if you rank them. I mean, it's not the same, but if you rank as per states, they still fall in the same lines. Okay. So, so I can I can give this as maybe an you know we can put it as an appendix and saying that you know even if we have used the DRT. So one comment from uh, what I have is that some of the civil courts have commercial benches when resolution of debt contracts can be heard. So maybe if you have that kind of data, you can probably make a classification based along this dimension, if at all. You are. And second, we have I have one more clarification question, if, if you don't mind. So uh, the question is, is the dependent variable default is available in MCA? No, it's, we have taken that from uh, civil uh, suit filed cases, so where uh, the bank acknowledges the default and starts the legal you know, uh, recovery processes. So uh, that is publicly available. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, civil so TransUnion Civil is the website. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Srinivas, for such an, uh, uh, and uh, Nishant as well for this wonderful uh, interaction and presentation. It was really very insightful. and. Uh, Probably you guys will stay around to, for another for our last presentation. Sure, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, finally, I'm very excited to present our next speaker, Dr. Lurian Demello, uh, who is a senior lecturer at the Department of Applied Finance at Macquarie University. He's going to present a review of behavioral finance research uh, from 1991 to 2021, and he's going to summarize what kind of research methodology and the uh, the conclusions of the paper that has been published in top journals of uh, finances. So, Lurian, it's all yours. It's a bit slow. Sorry. If you're on time. Okay. Can you can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Um, not not yet. Still. Yeah, I think it's going to work. Yeah, your desktop is visible, Lulu. Is that good? Yeah, it looks all good. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, fantastic uh, presentations. Uh, and yeah, I mean, look, um, my job here is uh, pretty much to, you know, give you an overview of uh, behavioral finance. So uh, I decided to go with the theme of the conclave, uh, 1991 to 2021. And I just want to kind of, um, you know, make everyone aware, just from not just from an academic perspective, but also, you know, from a practitioner sort of involvement, because I think academic research also needs to be supported by, you know, practitioners uh, who are looking at various behavioral elements. Um, I know that in Australia, a lot of the banks have a behavioral economics division where, you know, um, behavioral scientists, either from psychology or from, from or even people from linguistics, uh, from neuroscience, uh, behavioral economics, uh, are making a lot of contribution, you know, in terms of understanding, you know, customers' needs, uh, in terms of designing and promoting financial products, uh, banking products, and so forth. So, so that it, it's, it's a vast area. And, and um, I mean, my area is in energy economics as well. Uh, if you look up uh, my publications or if you just search me online, um, I have a lot of um, 
uh, interest in energy economics, but behavioral finance is also something that I'm very much uh, you know, interested in and uh, managed to do a few things uh, you know, in terms of publications. So yeah, so I just want to start off with um, you know, the typical, um, I guess, um, you know, the main, main contributors to, um, to um, behavioral finance. So that's uh, Daniel Kahneman, um, you might have come across him, um, and Amos Tovesky uh, on the right. So it's, um, I guess, uh, these, are, these are the main contributors to behavioral finance. Uh, so they came up with things like prospect theory, uh, heuristics, um, you've got uh, other sort of uh, biases like cognitive biases uh, where, you know, Daniel Kahneman came up with, you know, like loss aversion. He worked on judgments and decisions. Uh, these things become very important, uh, particularly uh, people who are accountants, people who are auditors, you know, because a lot of things are judgment based. I mean, you know, I don't want to go into a rules based versus you know, principles-based sort of uh, accounting, but, uh, you know, judgments and decisions are something that are uh, extremely important um, for, for various, uh, you know, practitioners. So, I mean, look, um, you know, I don't want to go too much into the theories, but, you know, the, the main role of behavioral finance is to, you know, apply psychological theories to financial models, right, to, to explain market anomalies. And there's tons of research that's been done uh, in a, not just on prospect theory, which is kind of based on, on a lot of uh, expected utility theory, uh, where probability is replaced by weights. Uh, so I've done a little bit of work on that, uh, on, on, on looking at overconfidence in, in markets. Uh, other theories are like disposition effect. Uh, you know, so this is where investors tend to hold assets you know, that have lost value. Uh, so you tend to hold because you're expecting assets to turn around or your stock stock uh, holdings to turn around. And we tend to, um, you know, sell assets uh, that have gained value because you're afraid that those assets might go back into the into the red, right? So, so there's all these, um, you know, theories around that. And another theory is uh, overconfidence. So overconfidence has become quite popular these days, uh, you know, with asset markets and stock markets, uh, you know, reaching record highs. Everyone's kind of, you know, I, I was listening to the previous presentations, you know, about uh, looking at, you know, bubbles and 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 whatnot. Is the is the market overvalued? Right, that's on on everyone's mind at the moment. So, you know, understanding the the behavioral element of how you know overconfidence uh, operates because. You know, we tend to like, you know, overestimate our own abilities, right? If you ask people, how good are your driving skills? Oh, I'm the best driver in the whole world. Uh, everyone else drives badly and they're more likely to cause accidents, right? So there are all these uh, questions uh, where, you know, participants can uh, respond to. Um, and, and that gives us an overall indication of whether people are overconfident in their own abilities, right? So, so there are theories like the, like, like, um, you know, self attribution bias, where you know if if you trade a stock or if you trade a share and you make gains, you know everyone takes credit and says, "Oh yeah, see, I'm very good, you know, very skilled at trading." But if it goes down, we tend to blame someone else. We tend to blame the market. We tend to blame you know some other factor that caused a decline in, in that stock. So. And also in the previous section, you know, the, there was discussion about the efficient market hypothesis about Eugene Farmer uh, and, and uh, Schiller, who opposes the efficient market hypothesis. So, so there's, there's a bit of discussion around that. Um, but le in lately, there's been a lot of research being done on investor sentiment. Uh, you know, this is where, you know, I guess um, it's not just traditional um, you know, sources that investors are using. There's a lot of social media, uh, social network sentiment, micro blogging. Um, you know, you have um, various, I guess, stock stock market. You know, forums. Uh, you got Reddit, um, and 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 all these other platforms where people have kind kind of used that. You know, to increase uh, you know sentiment towards a particular industry or a particular company. I mean, you probably would have come across GameStop and what happened there. So, so you know, investor sentiment is 
has a lot of theoretical, you know, really complex theoretical type models. And, and there's also, I guess, uh, methods like in terms of experiments uh, that, that people can design to measure investor sentiment. So um, judgments and decisions, right? I mean, this is a, you know, it's an area that's, that's like, you know, phenomenally sort of uh, researched, um, you know, starting off with these order effects, right? Um, and belief updating. So if a company uh, has positive news and negative news to communicate to shareholders, how does it do that, right? Um, do you present the, the positive news first? Do you present the negative news first? Um, you know, how, how do you design, how, how do you present that communication? Um, if you're in the, in the law scene, um, I know OP Jindal is very famous for its law school. Um, it might be like the jury, you know, is the jury going to remember the first thing that they um, hear? Are they going to pay more importance to the first uh, piece of information or are they going to be paying more attention to the last bit of information, right? So research has shown that the jury might listen to information that's presented first. So Hogart and Einhorn, I mean, these are pioneers, uh, you know, it, it's, a very, it's a very old paper. Uh, but it's got like 2,050 sort of citations, right? And, and, and so for, from an investor's perspective, you know, when we make decisions, uh, an investment decision, um, how do we go about it, right? Do we update our beliefs uh, towards a particular company or to a, towards a particular, uh, you know, industry based on information arrival, right? So, so there's a whole psychological theory on, on what we call primacy and recency effects. And this is something that we tested through designing a stimulus, uh, you know, so when you do an experiment, you need to design a stimulus and we have a set of questions, we have different subjects. Uh, so I don't want to go too much into the methodology, but so I, I would like to make you guys aware that primacy and recency is, is a very well applied uh, psychological theory. So, and as I said, belief adjustment model, uh, you know, there's also an area of impression management. Uh, remember, um, you know, the, you know, the, the users of uh, financial information, like the accountants who put the financial information together, it's, you know, that information is meant to be neutral, unbiased and value free, right? Um, so, but however, uh, you know, information used by investors and capital market participants for making economic decisions, you know, can, can, because it's made by accountants who are using judgments and decisions. So it cannot, it can be clouded with some sort of bias, right? Because, uh, you know, the, the financial statements are audited, but the narrative component of an annual report is not audited, right? So having a better understanding of, you know, what, again, like things like Q competition, right? Using certain words, you know, sometimes there's a statement and then it says, but, you know, so how often is that but used? for example, uh, are there any sort of pictures that I use, right? So mining companies might use, you know, a picture of like a beautiful green field where someone's running, right? So they kind of portray themselves to be a bit more green. So this is becoming really important with these ESG factors, right? Environmental, social and governance factors. Uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure on companies to disclose these factors more on the environmental side of things. So. You know, you can use tools like natural natural language processing tools. You can work with linguistics. You can work with psychologists. You know, in a really transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary sort of environment to understand exactly how different industries and different companies are using these, you know, clever sort of techniques to to kind of, you know, give a, create an impression. Right? I'm not saying all the time it's a false impression, but it, it creates this impression. Um, so as I said, self, self uh, you know, attribution bias, uh, you got the, you know, the overconfidence, uh, salience, you know, is like a big area, um, you know, from neuroscience, you know, how do you make things stand up, right? So, so all these things have been used by marketers, you know, to, you know, because at the end of the day, the annual report is a marketing tool and, and, and you know, how do you design an annual report? How, how do you design you know, get investors to subscribe to, you know, um, I guess, capital raisings and so forth. So I just listed some papers here, but you can, you can look up on, on Google Scholar, um, you know, to, to see how, 
uh, if you want to read or if you can't have access to it, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to uh, provide these papers to you. Okay, so what I did now, okay, is um, we used, um, you know, a systematic literature review. And, and I think the previous uh, presentation on PCA, I mean, this would be a perfect example to, to apply a systematic literature review approach to see what the consensus is in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the PCA situation. So, so here uh, we can see that, you know, just looking from 1991 to 2021, the publications in, in behavioral uh, finance have, have increased quite a bit. Now, I didn't, I didn't just look up everything on behavioral finance. You know, I tried to look up things on like judgments and decisions, uh, impression management, uh, you know, salience and all these other key words, right? So, so it does take a, a bit of effort, you know, it takes hours to actually, you know, come up with a systematic literature review based on your research question, right? So, so my idea was to actually find out what is it that, you know, academics, well, what, what research are academics doing in that kind of space, right? And, and, and I will come back a bit later on about neuromarketing and neuroscience, right? People are using this MRI, they're using brain scanners, they're using the skin conduit um, conduction things to come up with this physiological evidence, you know, to see how investors react. It could, you could uh, also measure traders, you could measure people who are doing high frequency trading and so forth. So, I mean, here on, on the citations, uh, you know, score map, you can see that, uh, the um, you know the, the the publications have really skyrocketed. So so the key part here is this is GCS, which is called a, a you know a global citation score, and this is called a local citation score. So local is when you know people cite um, you know the, the paper within within the same data set. So altogether we had like nine hundred and twenty five publications. So we haven't gone through all these papers yet. Um, you know, this is like really hot off the press. We literally did this you know, over the last week. Um, and, and there's a global citation score, which is very important because these are the number of citations that the publication has received in the total web of science database. So we have a web of science database. I'm not sure if your library is uh, subscribed to that, but it's actually run by a company called Clarivate. And, and this is a really good database to actually do a good literature review uh, search. Okay, so 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 the you want the the bar bar charts to be lining up with the with the line because that shows that your research is actually being cited by people outside, you know, uh, on a global scale. So this is where where you want to be. Yeah. So look, uh, I mean, Journal of Behavioral Finance um, is the is the top one with eighty seven, uh, you know. Uh, publications. Um, then you have Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, very difficult to get in. We try to publish over here. I've got a couple of papers in Journal of uh, Behavioral and Experimental Finance. This is a really upcoming journal. Uh, it recently got upgraded. Journal of Banking and Finance, super hard to get, get into. Uh, journal of Financial Economics and so forth. So we can see that a lot of finance journals, and then you have these things like economic psychology, then it's again applied, you know, so it's, it's a lot of um, uh, finance, you know, accounting and finance is a journal that's based in Australia, so it's ranked A according to ABDC. So, so we can see that, you know, ha have a good idea of where the papers are going. So if you do do some research in, in this area, um, you can, you know, target certain journals, right? So I, I can make these slides available to the audience, uh, Kaja, so because I don't want to spend too much time. There's, there's a lot of stuff in there. Well, that would be great. That you, Sorry to yeah. interrupt, Lorraine. You have got five more minutes. Yeah, sure, sure. Look, Thank I mean, look, they, these are these are a whole bunch of researchers, you know, by publication. Um, you might have heard of Daniel uh, Hischleffer, right? He, he's very famous. Um, you know, he's been around for decades, and and he's a he's a prolific uh, uh, researcher in, in behavioral finance. So we can see top countries, uh, you know, we, we can get a lot of information from that. You can get top organizations. You can see which universities. I'm glad I had no idea that Macquarie University would come up, uh, you know, in this lot, but you can see who's, who's publishing where, right? So, and, and this is like great insight. I mean, you know, this is another like graphical representation pretty much 
of what's on this slide, um, you know, and it gives you all these kind of heat maps to see who's who's really prominent. And and you can see like Yang CP is very very only started publishing in 2013 2015, but got massive citations for a paper, right? So it's not about quantity; it's about quality. If you want to publish in A and A star journals, you cannot go go for uh, quantity. It, it takes a, a couple of years, and you can see India is here. Uh, publishing mostly with the US, whereas Australia is kind of all over the place. But you can see from this map that USA, uh, the US leads the um, you know, publication sector. And this is just another way of uh, looking at the citation map. So the, the, so the thicker the line, the more sort of collaboration that's taking place between continents and between countries. So this is, I think, gives you a, a good overview. Um, and then just a couple of minutes. So I thought, okay, let's let me look up, you know, who are the leading behavioral finance researchers in India. Um, and and you can see, you know, it has increased, but uh, we can even like uh, find information um, by names, right? So you can look up who these uh, researchers are. Um, so you can see their global citation score total. So so the more global citation scores you have. Uh, the better it is because then that way you can you can you know i guess build your credibility in terms of uh you know people referencing you outside you know globally um so you can see some of the universities even uh that are that are publishing in in behavioral finance uh and and i guess you could contact people in in that space as well um yeah so it's just like look there's a lot of information that you can you can take uh, extract out of this literature uh, review, and and uh, and and then one thing that, as I said, I looked up neuroscience, behavioral science, because this is going to be the future, right? Um, people want more and more sophisticated way, right? You, you don't want to just send a questionnaire to someone and and fill out some you know behavioral thing, you know, experiments in labs, uh, you know, is, is becoming popular, as I said. Um, neuroscience is, is becoming really popular as well. So look, there are, there are a whole bunch of, um, you know, factors you could look up. And uh, yeah, and, and look, this, this is one, this, this person here, I forgot his first name, but Aids. I mean, he's, he's uh, been around for many, many years. I think since, uh, you can see, since 1994. And you can see that his research was around environmental disclosure. Uh, you know, in terms of accounting, uh, you know, uh, sustainability and, and so forth. But then he's now moved into areas like, you know, how, can you issue a coin, like if you're a blockchain uh, company and you're trying to raise funds, uh, you know, can you issue a coin uh, in, in terms of, um, I guess, uh, as an investment, right, if you want to invest in terms of a VC kind of uh, space. So, so he's done a behavioral paper around that in terms of the tone that he's used right so so it all comes down from the tone from the top right the tone from the chairman in in in, in an annual report how, how, how is it uh, you know what is the linguistics sort of analysis around that so so the tone around a prospectus for example you could you could analyze that right for different industries for for different companies so yeah i mean look i, I think I'll, I'll stop there and uh you know probably take some questions uh if there are any and that's my little T-shirt here with Etsy Goa because I was born in Goa, and uh, that's the team that I follow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing the picture as well as a wonderful uh, insight into behavioral finance research. And I'm sure there's a lot to uh, infer, uh, learn from this and draw from your presentation, especially for a researcher who is interested in, in behavioral finance. We have a few uh, one comment and question from one of the uh, audience. So Hamid uh, uh, is asked, is, he says that, thank you for bringing a practical orientation to your presentation, Lurin. Given the pandemic we are going through, what do you foresee is an emerging area of research for academics? Specifically in the area of behavioral finance, are there any interesting examples that finance academics have observed during the pandemic? Yeah, look, um I guess during the pandemic, you know, we have a lot of things like, you know, house prices going up, right? I don't know how it is in India, but here, you know, in Australia, the house prices have gone crazy. So I think you could you could do a lot of behavioral uh, research around literacy. Um, you know, people do people really understand 
you know, the implications of, you know, of an increase in interest rates, for example, right? Um, you know, and, and, and I mean, just looking at pandemic, but I think if you look at like, we have had the COP26 and it hasn't been very successful. Uh, you know, I know there's an environmental section on next, um, you know, but companies are continuously you know, required to disclose their carbon footprint, right? So, so do investors, retail investors have a proper understanding of, you know, ESG elements, you know, so do they actually understand these sustainability reports? Do they actually take that into account? So I think you could use, you know, a linguistics, as I said, natural language processing type. And this is something that I'm trying to work. You'd have to work with someone from like Department of Computing or something like that, or someone who has really good natural language processing skills. You'd have to know Python, you have to know R and all these uh, software, right? So, so, you, so, so look, yeah, so Look, the, the opportunities are there, um, but I think in terms of, you know, look at your own discipline and and perhaps try to do this systematic literature review and bibliometric analysis based on, on, on your own discipline. I mean, we had credit risk, quite a bit of credit risk stuff, you know, distance to default. I mean, you know, I, I do know a little bit about that because I teach, you know, banking and finance uh, units. Um, so, you know, look, see what the literature is at the moment, right? Um, yeah. So look, don't just focus too much pandemic. There's a lot of pandemic papers that are coming out, um, you know, and 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 some of them are, are I find are not of very good quality because they've just like taken one years of data and tried to apply a time series model, you know, do causality tests and so forth, right? But if you look at the econometric side of things, you need a longer time span, I think, to really understand. This is a very unique phenomenon, right? Too many factors moving, too many goalposts that are moving. So, so I would, I would, uh, yeah, look, look at, you know, the future. You know, if you're in finance, you know, disclosure and and how the narrative component is is communicated to shareholders, and is there any sort of manipulative type tricks that are used? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, one question is from uh, Amlan. So uh, he asks whether you can give us a bit about what students of behavioral finance can look forward to as jobs in the industry or maybe the government or public sector jobs? Yeah, look, as I said, look, bank, banks are hiring behavioral economists. Um, you know, of course, you. that's why I said it's important to understand a little bit of neuroscience, okay? Neuroeconomics, neuromarketing. If you look up all these terms online, you will see a lot of research being done around it. Um, it's the same thing like if you want to work in like blockchain, right? I had to give a presentation on about the future of cryptocurrencies. And, you know, I had to really understand about proof of work, proof of stake, private keys, public keys, right? But if you ask me to program something on an Ethereum platform, I wouldn't have a clue, <laughs> right? So, so, so you need to, I guess, understand a little bit. You know, ha have that sort of marketing, business development type hat on, even though you're a finance, uh, you know, um, graduate, and and just have that ability to think critically. You know, understand the part, the like the 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 seminal papers, right? I mean, the key important papers in behavioral finance and what is they're trying to do, like prospect theory and all this kind of stuff, and try to find. You know, in terms of you know a bank, it might might be different. It could be from a regulator, right? It could be the stock exchange regulator who is trying to control continuous disclosure with companies. You know, so so how could the regulator, you know, have um, I guess a, a stronger sort of understanding of of this? You know, I guess the narrative side of things. Yeah. I think uh, one question which probably is more contemporary, more relevant lately, because how do you think the wider presence or growing presence of social media is affecting these biases? For example, take an example of GameStop prices. I mean, mm. that became really overpriced. I mean, one may argue about efficient market hypothesis, but then looking yeah. at the behavioral biases, does it further push us the, these biases or does it try to balance it out? I mean, what is the role yeah. of social media in all of this? Yeah, I mean, social media on these platforms can be very dangerous, right? Um, you know, it's all about, look, do your homework. Don't go with the herd. It's not like the herd, right? So people are trying to build yeah. these, yeah. Um, you know, herding sort of type measures. And, and it can be very dangerous because 
you're, you're going against hedge funds with multi-billion dollars, right? And they could, they could have half a billion to lose. So if you're trying to short stocks, uh, you know, trying to like, you know, get a group together and try and fight, like we are told, don't fight the central banks, don't discuss with the central banks what they do, um, particularly with monetary policy, right? Um, and, and, you know, so don't fight against hedge, hedge funds, right? So, so I think, you know, look, use, use these platforms. They can be quite informative. In the same way, if you're on LinkedIn, you know, you can get a lot of information.